Good afternoon, and thank you for being here, and welcome to preparing for next time. I'd like to please give a warm welcome to our speaker, Laura Fiala. Laura is the founder of Birth with Knowledge and is an evidence-based birth instructor. She teaches childbirth education to both parents and professionals around the valley. Laura is passionate about making sure every birthing family has the knowledge to make informed decisions in their birthing time. Thank you, Laura. Hi. So I am really excited you guys are all here today. Um, so I just wanted to take a few minutes and I want to know why you guys are here. So I have my super awesome friend. This is my plush placenta. So birth sometimes gets a little, little heavy. So we're going to try to lighten them up and we're going to throw them around the room. And if you guys want to share just a little bit while you're here, we're just going to take a couple minutes to kind of, kind of see where everyone's coming from. Anyone want to start? birthing experience the first time so I just want to be more prepared this um, for the second time and just kind of know um, where I can reach out for more support and education awesome anybody else like to share why they're here with us today throw it back there Try to throw it. <laughs> uh, I'm a postpartum doula and so I want to gather some more information to be able to talk to my families about um, even though their baby's new, they uh, should experience a, a good birth. And if they didn't, where can they go for help? Oh, awesome. We're thinking about having another, and so just getting more information about like, how to prepare for that and maybe make the experience better. Awesome. Anybody else? <laughs> no, you're kidding. Okay, so we are gonna, we've got a couple of objectives today. So our first objective is we're gonna define evidence-based care, and we're gonna discuss the differences between evidence-based care and routine care. Um, we are gonna describe the top-down hierarchy of the maternity care system, and we're gonna discuss ways to create a team-based atmosphere in the birthing room. Okay. Um, as we chit chat, I'm just going to pass this around. I do have some handouts for class, so if you guys would like them, if you want to leave your email, I will get them sent over to you. Just didn't know how many people were going to be here and whatnot, so I didn't want to print 110 people show up or vice versa. So, um, so tell me, what do you guys think? What do you think evidence-based care is? Research backs up decisions you make. Okay. So um, it's pretty simple. Evidence-based care means that it's the care based on the best medical evidence. Um, and so we have a kind of a way to look at it. And we can look at it like a three-legged stool. So what happens if you take a three-legged stool and you take one of the legs away? It falls down, it falls down right? <laughs> boom. So if you take out any of these any of the legs of the stool, it goes, it falls down. So our first leg is that best medical research. So that's the evidence. That's the research that's being, that's being done all over the country and all over the world, showing us maybe what we don't know or what we thought we knew and is now different. Um, and it's actually kind of a new way of doing things. Um, so how do you guys think that doctors did things before evidence-based care, or how some of them still do it. Trial and error. Trial and error. Okay. Anecdotal. Story. Anecdotal. Yeah, that's a big one. So they kind of do um, what, they're, what they've seen and what their experience and their traditions have shown us, have shown them. So, and a lot of it's very, little of it is based in research. So for a long time, um, a big one was that they would shave women's pubic hair before birth. And it wasn't because there was something better or it made babies healthier, cleaner. It was just that they thought it was cleaner. Like that was the only thing that, that there was there for. Um, doctors used to separate moms and babies after they were born because they thought it prevented infection. So babies would stay in the nursery for up to a week and then they would just send mom and baby home together 
and they're like, okay, here you go, here you are, now your mom, even though the nurses had been caring for them all week. So, and we've now shown that to be very actually detrimental to mom and baby relationship. Um, so the second leg of our stool is an experienced care provider. Um, and not just necessarily an experienced care provider, but one that knows your history. So one that knows what's been going on with you, um, what's been going on with your baby, what happened in your previous pregnancies. Um, and so we can, we can get tied to the evidence, right? If we go and we play Dr. Google and say, okay, we know, we know all this stuff, but then our, our care provider is the one that kind of brings it all together and shows us that, well, maybe you have gestational diabetes, so this, um, this procedure may not be such so good for you, or maybe you do need an ultrasound at the end of pregnancy just to check in on baby. So different things, they're, they're taking into consideration what your medical history is, not just playing Dr. Google. Sound good? Makes sense? Okay. So, and then our third um, leg of our stool is individual gal excuse me, individual goals, values, and preferences. So that means that what you think matters, right? If you guys don't want something to happen in birth, that matters. It does, if you don't want an IV because you're afraid of needles or you drink enough water, then that matters what you think, not just the hospital policy. Okay, um, so having all three of these is important. So can you guys see that if we have 10 different people, different families in one room, that all of their births could be totally different because all of your values, your goals, and your preferences are what is a huge determining factor in, um, in your birth, right? have questions on anything that we've about the evidence-based about the stool kind of makes sense okay all right so discussion question here so why do you guys think it's important for families to have evidence-based care what do you think I've got prizes for talkers. I mean, it's like show, like, I don't know, I don't know it's like a proven method. Okay. Right? Take a pick. Okay. You know it works. Huh? You know it works. You know it works, right? Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um,. Okay, so evidence-based care is considered the gold standard in medicine, um, and in fact is across the world, but research shows that many families um, receive aspects of care that is not evidence-based. The big reason for this is called the evidence practice gap. So has anybody heard of the evidence practice gap? Okay, so this is talking about how long it takes evidence and research to make it into the hospital. Does anybody have an idea of how long it takes that to happen? Five years. Five years? I feel longer than I think ten years. Ten years? Okay, so what if I told you it was 15 to 20 years? It's crazy, right? So that means stuff that was done in like the 90s is now finally getting into the hospital system. Stuff that's happening today is going to take another 15 years to make it into our mainstream um, care system. Um, so what are some reasons that, what, why are some reasons that it's hard to make change in the hospital? I think it's hard for certain professionals to admit that they still have to be smart. Okay. Things are going to be different than what they were taught. Mm-hmm. Money. Money? <laughs> Money's big. Insurance companies. <laughs> They're hard. Um, yeah, so there's liability. There's, there's people in charge that don't want to change. Change is hard, right? doesn't matter what you're doing. Change is hard. And so now we're telling these people that we know better than they do, and even though they went to medical school. And, but if you think about it, doctors and OBs have a hard time keeping up with all the research. 
Can anyone think why? So they are, um, they see a full caseload of patients, right? Then they have to take call. Then they want to have a family life. You know, shocker, they actually want to see their kids too, right? So when do they have time to read all this research? Okay. So um, that's a big, so one of the major reasons why it's hard for families to get evidence-based care is because of the power structure that's set up in our hospitals and in our healthcare system. Um, it makes it difficult to create change and to update the practices to stay in line with evidence. So I've got a little activity for us to do. So if you all stand up. And I'm gonna pass <clears throat> You get to me too. <laughs> okay, so we are, I would like, we're gonna, so everyone has a place, okay, in our hospital system. And what we need to do is, as a group, we need to line up in order of the most powerful person over here to our least powerful people over here, okay? All right? So what do you guys think? Okay, so who? Okay. So what do you guys think? So you gotta come with me. Okay, so least powerful. So how much? I get all the power of the doctor. Well, but the, what? How much power does the baby itself have? Oh, see you later. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, so hospital, where do you think? Where do you think our hospital lawyer lands? Pretty powerful. Yeah. I would think everybody has to say. Are we ready? Here? Yeah, you guys are good right there. I'm just giving some room so we can. I don't know what you guys think. Where do you think our hospital lawyer lands? I was going to say there. Okay. Okay, and where does our midwife land? No. No. After the nurse. After the. Oh. Between the doula and the nurse. I think. More. I think maybe. I think about. Okay. Where they're birthing. Okay. okay. Yes. So yes. we're we're, in the hospital. we're birthing in a hospital with privileges. Oh, yeah. Come on in. I need one more person. Come on. <laughs> actually, yeah. You, we need. We both think you can come participate. Come participate. No, actually, you can. You can pitch in on this. Okay. So where do you guys think our nurse or midwife lands? Sure. Okay. So you can come be our. You can come be our midwife. Yes. Come be the midwife. So least. You guys tell me where the least. We're doing. For, so we're least powerful to most powerful. In terms of a hospital. In terms of a hospital birth, where would you place our midwife? Welcome to the class. Like least power. <laughs> Where's the mama? The least to the most power? Yeah. Okay. Where's you guys are mom. Birth, you were mama. Birthing person. Oh, this oh, is I mom. Mean, that's mom. Okay, I didn't. I'm we didn't realize that. You, okay. okay. So I think you guys. Hold on. You guys are good. Right. Yeah. Just hang out right where you are. Wait. Are we talking importance of like during the delivery? How, yeah. Of the hospital. Of, so at, during. In, we're talking about delivery right now. So where does our midwife? How much power does our midwife have when we're talking about in our obstetrics unit? <laughs> it's a big Nobody decision. Knows. It is. It's like I think it's, it's like I feel like it's up there. The but like, yeah. Yeah. oh wait, on there. but yeah. That's you guys awesome. can move stuff. We don't I'm have like, to. I just want to move all this. I, we this is this is not how it should be. How it typically is. Oh, how it currently, currently is. is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, hold, hold on. Come on back. So you're a, you are a midwife with privileges. Like you're you're wanting to be like. Yeah. After the nurse, the primary care nurse of the patient is what the hospital. Well, current where it should be, it should be higher. I'm gonna say no, no, no. I would somewhere with the parents. Come with yeah, me. somewhere maybe right here. Okay. Like somewhere with the parents too. Because I know okay. she trusts okay. you more than she trusts me. Absolutely. Okay, so how? So right now we have our hospital admin, our hospital lawyer, chief OB, OB, family doctor, resident, nurse manager, nurse, birthing person, midwife, 
parent doula baby. Okay, I'm gonna make just just a couple changes. I'm gonna move you. Yeah. You come here. You have you. Little I was right. I know. You I stand here. Too. You I stand here. Too. Okay. So sometimes, depending on the hospital, these two will switch back and yeah. forth. So this is our resident and our midwife. Depends on the hospital, but our resident is t technically a doctor. They have a doctor. They're doing their um, specialty rotation in obstetrics. Okay. And I'm going to take our doula, mm -hmm. and they're going to sit right here. Okay. Yeah, the reason the doula tends to have a little bit more power is because they're used to the hospital environment. So the doulas have typic have come in. They've yeah, they can they can help empower these people. But our doula has at least some lay of the land. So maybe they know some of the nurses. They kind of know what what's normal in this hospital. How to kind of wiggle in, wiggle around, kind of stuff like that. Okay, so how do you guys feel at the top? I don't. I don't really Dark. feel like <laughs> it's that I, like I'm that important. I no. Feel like some of things that, as a mom, I would listen to more than. Okay. If that's what we're talking about, like you know, as we're having birth. Right. Who does the mom listen to, and is she in the most power? Yeah, but who? Okay, so I totally see where you're coming from. But that the lawyer has so much control over all these other people because yeah. they're the ones that are like, they don't want to get sued. So they're telling, they're telling the admin and the, o, the chief OB who tells the OB who tells, you know. But what, do you guys, what, else, what other feelings do you guys have for being at the top? So not connected to yeah. those. Guys. Yeah, just yeah. Being, yeah you're not, so you're not connected to them at no. all. Can you like even, you can you barely them even them see or, them? No. no. Okay. I never talk to them, deal with them. Right. They kind of dictate policy mm -hmm. and procedure without yeah. being hands on. Right. I feel like they probably wouldn't see the reality of like the day to day in and out of like, I'm a baby, I need help. Mm -hmm. you know, and, like, so they get really, they get really rem removed, right? Yeah. And there was a problem and they had to deal with it. Then, mm -hmm. then yeah. So, like, so, do you think they're happy? Probably not. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Making a good job. So they're making some good money, but they got a lot of power. They're they're like in charge of a lot of people, and they don't know anything oh, about stress. them. Stress. stress. stress yeah. Okay. How how do our how does our tri tri trio here feel? Control. Great. I just had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you feel being all the way at the bottom? I think it's scary. Scary. Yeah. I feel like, especially if you're a new, well, I can't talk as a baby, but I, <laughs> as like a new parent, especially, I think it's really scary because you don't know even who sometimes your people are, yeah. you know, who can help, help you, you or support right. you. And especially, obviously, as a baby. Baby. You Baby's just, got me. They have no control. Okay. Yeah, so, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to sneak between you real super fast. Okay. So, you don't. Don't stab yourself with the pen. <laughs> and you guys get a pen. You get a pen. Okay. So now you get to sword fight with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what do you guys think about our people in the middle? Are they happy? They're probably they're, the least happy. They're, they're least happy? <laughs> they're busy? Okay. So seriously, you can sword fight with each other. They can also be in conflict with each other. <laughs> Power, right? Yeah. They're in con So <laughs> this right here is there's this thing called horizontal violence that happens when there's these people in the middle that they have so much power on their shoulder and they have so much responsibility, but they can't do anything about it. And so they fight with each other and they get this. Have you guys ever heard of the, the nurses eat their young kind of thing? So the nurses, like when new nurses come in, the, the experienced nurses want them to do things their way. They don't want stuff to change. So they are not very nice to our new nurses. Okay, so I want what, you three come this way and stand right here. And then will you guys circle this way? And we're gonna make we're gonna make a circle. You guys just come this way and like we're gonna make a circle around our baby and our mama and our and our partner. Okay, so how does this feel? Much better. Whoa. Like we're protected. Whoa. We're filming, but yeah, protected. Okay. What about you guys? Access. Yeah. I have access to everyone here. And it's not 
down there and I'm down here. Okay, and what about what about our top people? What do you guys think? Probably better because we can make a difference or okay. at least connect but you can, with people to you know can see how them, we're right? Doing yeah. Like you at least see who you're making policy for? Yeah. They're like right in front of you. Like, so do you have a hospital that's like this? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 if we did, then I probably wouldn't be teaching this class. <laughs> okay, so this is what we call family centered care. So this is what you guys are like what we would hope for. And unfortunately right now you're probably looking at an out of hospital birth to get this care. But there are ways that you can that we can help get you guys more of this, even if it's just in your hospital room. So we're gonna chat about that now. So if you guys just wanna put the papers on the desk there, um, or I can take them more. Um, and we're gonna chat a little bit more. We've got like 20 minutes today. You'll get my drink. <laughs> Thank you guys. Okay. So, we have a couple tickets. Just gonna randomly pass these out. And I'll give you guys one. Okay, so I just passed out. These are our tickets out of that top down care system. Um, so even though I kind of walked through this, you guys can really create your own reality. Um, and you really have the power to do that. Sometimes you just need the knowledge and the, to know what you're looking for, okay? So the person, is there, somebody has our Golden Express ticket. Will you open it and read it for us? A truly supportive provider and birth setting. Do you guys hear that? No. So a truly provor, a truly supportive provider and birth setting. So what does that mean? Why is that the golden ticket? Best outcomes for mom and baby. Best outcomes for mom and baby? It's rare. It's rare. <laughs> okay, so you don't have to fight for what you want. The birth setting has all the tools that you need. Um, and the provider is already in line with your wishes. Um, and it's, you're, it's not your agenda versus their agenda. The problem with some of that is even if you get a good provider, if you're not in a supportive setting, they still have all those people that were on top coming down on them on what they're doing. So you've got to kind of get both in there to get what you're, what you're really after. So what if you don't have that? Does someone have our ticket one? Support and education. So how do you guys know if you have the golden ticket? How do you know ahead of time? You don't? You don't? Okay. <laughs> prenatal care? Okay, so what are some red flags if you're in your prenatal care that might pop up that's telling you you don't have the golden ticket? You don't feel listened to? You don't feel listened to? Okay, complications. What about the body language of your provider? They rush you through it. Rush you through it? You kind of brush your questions off like, oh, well, we'll just deal with that when, when labor time comes. Like they can't give you, they can't give you an answer. Um, so why, why do people ignore their red flags? They get these red flags in their appointments, but they, they just kind of brush them off and they think they're gonna be the, they're, no, they're not gonna be the ones that get swept into the system why we ignore our red flags? Oftentimes, I think it's the norm. The norm? It's, it's what we're used to. Okay. We're used to being brushed off, we're used to not being listened to, especially in medical settings. Yeah. Often we're, we're told what this is, you have to, and we're told that lightning speed, and you have any questions, okay, as you're walking as out the door, as the professional's walking out the door, yeah. and so you feel like you don't have the space to ask questions or to even, because it's what everybody is experiencing. You're yeah. Not just yeah. Um, so, why? What kind of questions could you ask your OB or your midwife to find out if they're a supportive provider? You could go over your birth plan. Okay. Birth plan and what it was like. Okay. They could totally laugh at you or 
Just do it again. Maybe you'll get some more like really big red flags. <laughs> yeah. So one of the best ways is if you ask them open-ended questions. So you want to find out what their typical birth is like. So instead of changing their um, their whole philosophy, you want to see if you're going to mesh with the one they already have. So being, well, what's your typical birth look like? And it's like, oh, well, you get, come in and you get, I, you get an IV and you get a cervical check and you get stuck on the monitors and you can't get out of bed. Well, you might be hard pressed to get them to change just for you. But if you have a provider that's telling you supportive things, you, well, you don't have to be on the monitor and you can get up and roam around and you can walk and you can eat and you can drink, then maybe you're on the right track. Okay. So if we don't have our golden ticket, our next one is support and education. So why do you guys think it's important to have support during labor? Choice. Choice? You have choices. Yeah. I did put one <coughs> So I did what I did two times because I knew someone else who was nice enough to tell me their story and they felt like they had no choices. Yeah. Like they didn't have the support or the education when they needed it. You're stuck. To, I think, be more comfortable with the choices that they either felt like they had to make or um, felt like they were not given the information that they would have liked. Yeah. Um, also, often yeah. when you're in labor, you're not really in a place to like. You like, get. Hey, actually, I want this. You get labor brain, right? You go yeah. into like this labor world where you're just like, whoo, whoo. I don't know. You know anything that's going on, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what kind of people could be there, other than your partner? A doula. Midwife. Okay. A friend. Yeah. Um. All right, so tell me, what do you guys know about doulas? I love doulas. I love doulas. <laughs> so they're not midwives. So they don't do anything medical. They're going to be there to support you physically, mentally, emotionally, um, help get you into positions that are more comfortable. They may offer like, hey, why don't we try this now? Why don't we try that now? Um, and... Did you guys know that statistically, doulas will lower your chance of a cesarean? Like in research, it's proven, especially if you are having an induction. Um, it's like a, almost like a 10 point drop that they will help lower your cesarean rate. They also help lower the rate that baby may be admitted to the NICU. So it's kind of a huge thing. So what role does um, childbirth education play? Prep. Yeah. So you don't know what you don't know, right? If you don't know it, you have. if you don't know the options, you have no options. So if you know your options, then you can ask questions. Um, we, who has our ticket number two? All right, will you open it for us? Tell us what's inside. It says one ticket out communication must be combined with at least three other tickets in order to be valid. Yeah. So if you don't have that golden ticket, you need at least three of the four other tickets. So our second one is communication. So why do you guys think communication is important? That way others know what you want so they can act out those wishes of yours. Yeah, right. If you don't, they can't, they're not mind readers. They're doctors, nurses. Like they need, they need you to tell them what you guys want, what you're thinking. Um, so who do you guys think... It's whose job is it to communicate with staff during labor? Your support person. Huh? Your, Your support, support person? Okay. Um, so if I told you it was like it was your partner, but why not your doula? They're focused on you. They're focused on you? They believe doulas can't advocate for the mother. Okay. So a lot of doulas can't advocate for their mom. Were you gonna add something? Okay. Yeah, legally they can't. So they don't want to step on toes. So it's important that if you guys are doing some childbirth education, take your partners with you. Because that way they know your wishes and they can be the ones, they can advocate for you. Like, but your doula, although they can give suggestions, is likely not going to be the one that's advocating for you in birth. Isn't that the purpose of also having a plan, like on the written paper? Yeah. Is that they, the doula at least can provide that to the, to the doctor. Yeah. The yeah, yeah, they can put, they can give that to the doctor <laughs> or... Um, at least, yeah, your, your wishes are known somewhere, so. So, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, please. Like, if you want to 
wanted certain wishes during your birth, um, your doula can't express this to you, like, while you're in labor? So your doula can tell you, but they can't express it to the doctor. So, like, the doula can't, like, explicitly tell the doctor she doesn't want that. They can, the doula can ask you, it's like, hey, when we were talking, remember you said you didn't want an episiotomy, but the doctor has scissors in his hand. Is there something you want to say? But sometimes mom's in labor land and like is totally, I don't know, I just want the baby out. Like, and they're not, they're not thinking it through. But your partner can be like, don't cut her. Like the scissors can go away. Like they can, that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so... How can your birth partner, so that being boyfriend, husband, partner, wife, whoever, um, communicate with, with the providers and the nurses? What kind of tips and tricks can they use? You guys have any thoughts? Be direct. Be direct? Okay. So they can laugh. They can lighten the mood, but just being upfront, introduce themselves, say hi. It's like, hi, I'm Joe. I'm gonna, I'm so and so's partner, and I'm here to. I really want to help. Do you involve me in any way you can? Okay. Um, they being both assertive and friendly is really nice. So you're trying to win people over. We're not trying to be a us against them. We want your room to feel like a community. We want to bring everybody in. Okay. So, who's got our ticket number three? What does ticket number three say? Know your rights. Know your rights. This one always gives me chills because people don't know that they have rights when they're having a baby. So, did you know that you guys have this? So, let's go. Do you have the same rights when you are having a baby as you do when you're not pregnant? They don't go away. Just because you're having a baby doesn't mean you don't lose any rights. So you still have the right to say no to anything and everything that they're offering you in the hospital. That doesn't, just because you're pregnant, that doesn't make your autonomy go out the window. Um, so you have the right to something called informed consent. That means you have the right to complete and accurate information and you have the right to say yes or no freely without, without coercion um, and without being pressured. And this is, sorry, this is both your legal right and your ethical duty of the hospital staff. Also a big one, the informed, your consent form does not mean informed consent. So just because you guys sign the consent form, that still means the doctors and nurses should be giving, should be asking permission for everything that's going on in the hospital. That's down to like taking your blood pressure. It's not like, I'm gonna take your blood pressure now. They should be asking, is it okay for me to take your blood pressure now? But sometimes just the nursing that's, it was training that they had. So you just have to, you know, be gentle and be like, could you please ask? Yes, you're welcome to, but um, stuff along those lines. Um, so who is the legal authority in the labor and delivery room? Say it again. Okay. Any other thoughts? You. Yeah, mom is the legal authority of her own body. Um, it doesn't change. Um, but a lot of people say that. A lot of people think that the doctor is the legal authority. They can do whatever they want. Um, but it's mom. Mom still has that underlying decision. Um, okay. What can we get? Qu ticket four. Ticket four. This one's my favorite, guys. This one's. Love. Love. Um, so why is love one of the tickets out of the system? Reduces stress. Reduces stress. What else? Often the only thing like powerful enough to make you willing to fight the fight. To fight the thing. Um, so a big thing is, is that a lot of people in the hospital are hurting. So we guys saw when we were sword fighting, our midwives and our nurses, and they were sword fighting. They're hurting. So hurt people hurt people, right? It's, it's just kind of how it goes. So if you guys can bring love and empathy back into the room, they're going to look at you as an actual person instead of just, oh, that's so-and-so in room 23. She's been laboring for 16 hours, and we need to keep things going. Like, it's like, oh, no, that's Mary Jane, and she's really fighting for her natural childbirth. Like, that's... You make that, you make that, 
that's shift, okay? Um, it help, love helps everyone see each other as humans. Um, so how can we help the hospital staff see us as humans instead of just another number? Communication. Communication. Being kind. kind, yes. She can bring gifts. We had one dad that um, said that he, like, he brought the nurses coffee and they really liked it. Um, another suggestion was you can put, do an, a baking project early in labor to kind of pass the time and then you bring your baked goods and pass them out to the nursing staff. It's like, they're like, oh yeah, that's the one that brought the cookies and they want to help because it's, you're being kind and nice and kind of bringing that back. Um, you can also ask them about themselves, guys, because they have lives outside of what's going on. Maybe they have six kids at home and they were up all night and they're just tired or, you know, they're going through a really rough patch or their car broke down on the way to work. And it's like, we all just want to be heard. And so if we're hearing them, they're going to be wanting to hear us. So we make that connection and then they help fight for, for us to, for the rest of what's going on outside. Um, so have any of you guys heard of the five love languages? Yeah, anyone know what they are? Service. Acts of service? Okay. Words of okay. Gifts. Gifts. Quality time. Physical touch, all five. Good job. Mm -hmm. We're really impressed, guys. Um, so all of these can be brought in. If you're not a physical, touchy, feely person, you don't have to. But even just a handshake would be helpful. If you really want to give someone a hug, can, you know, ask, can I give you a hug? I just want to connect. You know, um, you can spend that quality time. You can uh, help. You know, maybe the nurses, it's like they need to go get something. It's like, oh, well, I can help go get sheets. Can you tell me where they are? Can you, you know do those small acts to make just make yourself and make them more human um so do you guys have any questions what else anything else coming to mind when we're talking about all these things So um, I do have a handout for you guys. I'll send it. It has all the tickets. Um, it talks about the power hierarchy. Um, and just kind of take some time to think that you guys have the power to change and to make the birth you want happen. You just need to take the time beforehand to, to do the research, find the, put your support staff together. Um, and it doesn't have to be this traumatizing event. It can be something beautiful that you'll keep and remember for for whole, your whole life. Yeah. I think also you were talking about like the first from the school and ticket, right? Mm -hmm. you the perfect, you know, set up scenario, whatever that is. But then also, so sometimes it's easy to think like, oh, well, I have that, you know, I'm set up with my midwife for 11 trials and my homework and my whatever. But there's always the chance that you do have to transfer. Transfer, yeah. You're no longer in that golden ticket. Yeah. So to prepare with all those other, other things, things you were saying. That's a great point. You have yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah, because birth, all, although we can try everything, it's still, it's still a little bit of a crazy roller coaster. <laughs> so that is a really good point that you can have that backup plan. And that's what's really nice is those doul the doulas will travel with you to the hospital and um, you kind of keep that. But that's great. You know, planning takes the stressors and takes the fear out of things. So if you know what's going to happen if you have to transfer, then there's no worrying and there's no fear about it because we just we already have a plan. We just keep going with it. All right. Well, I really, really appreciate you guys being here. I've got some lovely treats if you guys would like some on the way out. Um, and that's what I've got for you today. I think we've got just a couple minutes left. So if anyone's got questions, I'll hang out and stick around. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>